on June 4, 2004, a decades-long battle between a blue-collar welder and the municipal powers of small-town Granby, Colorado, crescendoed in a way that nobody could see coming. Pushed to his breaking point, Marvin Hemeyer shocked his adversaries along with the world when his makeshift tank emerged, ripping through the side of his own building before going on a two-hour suicidal rampage of revenge. Both citizen and police efforts to stop the jerry-rigged juggernaut were futile. He had created a bulletproof bulldozer with offensive capabilities beyond anybody's imagination. When his campaign of carnage was complete, he had knocked over 13 buildings and caused $7 million worth of damage. To this day, his actions have people split on if he's an American folk hero fighting against the corrupt or just a bitter laborer who escalated his personal disputes into a public disaster. Marvin John Hemeyer was born in the small town of Castlewood, South Dakota on October 28, 1951. He grew up on his father's large ranch outside of town which provided wealth for the family. His childhood was a simple, mostly uneventful one. He was shy, though personable, respectful, and rather intelligent. He did not spend much time making friends and preferred hanging out with his father while he worked on the ranch. Young Marvin never liked school much and despite being a bright child, he constantly struggled. After breaking his arm in fourth grade, his already average grades began to slide. It was then that his teacher told him that he would never amount to anything in life, something that stuck with him. His intelligence showed through his hobbies though, as he was a natural tinkerer and very talented when it came to working on machines. He would graduate from Castlewood High School, 28th of 29 in his class, and decided to forego college for joining the U.S. Air Force in 1969. In the early 70s, he was transferred to Lowry Air Force Base in Denver, Colorado, and instantly fell in love with the state. The breathtaking landscapes of the Rocky Mountains, the pristine lakes, and the winter sports like skiing and snowmobiling made a huge impression on him. He knew then and there that he would make his home in Colorado after his service was complete. After being honorably discharged in 1977, he bought a home in Denver. He got a job at a Scotty's Mufflers, a chain of auto repair shops in the area. He loved working on cars, and his passion translated into proficient and skilled work. In 1978, he decided to make his first business move, partnering up with a co-worker named Cliff Udy and purchasing one of Scotty's Muffler's franchise shops to operate themselves. Unfortunately though, Scotty's Muffler's filed for bankruptcy just a year later, leaving Marvin Cliff in a tight spot. The two inherited three of the closed shops, but were unsuccessful in trying to revive them. They were left with $10,000 in debt, so they decided to dissolve their partnership, sell two of the shops, and each keep one for themselves. In 1980, Marv sold his shop and used the money to move north to Boulder and open a garage there. And this was when the money started to flow for him. He was so good at his job that it became known that he could change a muffler in only 20 minutes, earning him the nickname Marv the Muffler Man around town. And his financial situation continued to improve as well, because Marv proved to not only be a talented muffler man, but a good businessman as well. Within a few years, his money was making money in real estate, leasing and selling property in Aurora, Lakewood, Inglewood, and Commerce City. But it wasn't all Colorado rainbows and sunshine. Sometimes, business can get dirty. In the mid-80s, he was tricked into a lease-to-own deal for a plot of land in Toponis, Colorado, from a company that had been padding their books with inflated assets. When that company went under, the mortgage company started the process of foreclosing on Marv's land. Knowing the legal fees would be more than it would be worth the fight, he ate the $57,000 loss. Soon after, 
He was deceived into another bad deal when he bought an apartment complex in Denver that was immediately foreclosed on. He was hoping the deal would recoup some of the money that he'd lost in the Deponis debacle, but he only ended up doubling down on his losses. Despite these hits to his pocketbook, his muffler business, Boulder Muffler, was doing better than ever. But jaded by the system, bad actors, and what he perceived as a government being unable to help small businessmen like himself, he decided to spend his extra time advocating for small businesses and libertarian causes. He started getting himself involved in local politics and writing strongly worded letters to local papers that warned against government overreach. Mar P. Meyer got back into real estate in 1992. He was getting tired of the big city life in Boulder. Now in his early 40s, he was looking for a slower pace. He sold his muffler shop in Boulder and purchased a 27-acre property in Grand County, Colorado for about 110 grand. It had a small cabin and a hot tub to relax his old bones after a long day's work. I think he was planning to take it easy and garner passive income through real estate purchases. When a friend asked him to look into a place to set up a muffler shop, he agreed to help him look. When he heard of an FDIC auction coming up in the town of Granby, he saw it as a good opportunity to buy a place and finance it to his friend. One property, a two-acre lot with a small shop building on it that had been foreclosed on, jumped out to Hemeyer as the perfect location for his friend to set up shop. The two agreed that 66000 would be a good price that they could both work with. After going to see the property with a realtor, Marv was offered the lot for 110000 before the auction. Hemeyer was smart enough to wait for the auction, knowing that he could get it cheaper there. On the day of the auction, there were over a hundred properties for sale. When his property, number 67, came up for sale, Marvin found himself bidding against one other man, a man named Cody Docheff. Cody Docheff, a member of the prominent Docheff family there in town, was owner of Mountain Park Concrete and was hoping to expand his operation in town. In fact, he was the previous owner of the property before he let it get foreclosed on. Cody had brought a man named Gus Harris, his financier, in his attempts to reclaim his property. But as Harris and Hemeyer bounced bids back and forth from twenty-five to thirty to thirty-seven thousand, Gus Harris decided he was going to be out if it went any higher. When Marvin Hemeyer bid forty-two thousand, he won the property that he had come for. Afterwards, Cody approached Marvin and let him know in so many words that it was his property and he was supposed to get it. About the rudest, most arrogant person. I mean, this guy's just a fucking asshole. Come back and just introduced himself, kind of, by just giving me a tongue lashing for about 10 minutes about, you know, who I thought I was and what I was going to do with the property. And I explained to him I was buying it for John Kleiner and... Uh, he said he wanted the property, and I said, well, I'll tell you, I'll sell you the property. I said, we were going to pay $66,000, and, uh, you know, I was, I told him I was selling it to John Kleiner, who was going to start an automotive store there, and he didn't want to have anything to do with it. He says, well, I'm sorry, but I says, you know, you, I can't just not come down here and spend my money and waste my time and not, you know, get make some money on it. So I offered it to him that day for what I was going to sell it to John for. Because I could tell the guy was pissed off, and I wasn't there to piss off any people. I mean, this is the only guy of all the properties that sold before his that was doing any screaming at anybody during the auction. I mean, 160 people, or 160 properties were sold that day, and this is the only fool that didn't come down there with enough money to buy his property. I mean, this shows you how day late and a dollar short this fool is. But little did Marvin Hemeyer know this squabble over two acres would become a feud between a simple welder and a small town of good old boys who were willing to work and scheme to make an outsider feel as if he wasn't welcome in their town. Not long after making the purchase, Hemeyer's friend who he was hoping to finance the place to got cold feet on the agreement because of some EPA cleanup that apparently needed to be done. 
This wasn't a huge problem for Marv, though, because the cleanup had largely been taken care of by the FDIC before auction. He let the property sit for a while before deciding he was going to get back into the muffler business. He started cleaning up the property and getting it ready to take on business, but during this time, a couple things came to light. First, he realized that his neighbor was Gus Harris, the man who was bidding on behalf of Cody Docheff, and he was also given notice that he would be required to hook up to the city's water and sewer system to comply with local zoning and property laws. And this shouldn't have been that big of an issue, but when he went to a compliance meeting, he was informed that the sewer district refused to help him reach the sewer line that was 400 feet away from his property. In order to get it done, he would have to foot the nearly $100,000 bill for a construction project to put in a sewage pipe that would take months. To make matters worse, Marv's property did not have a maintenance access easement to the hypothetical sewer line, and in order to build one, he would have to get permission from the neighboring property owner as it would need to traverse the property line. That neighbor was of course Gus Harris, Cody Docheff's business partner who refused to help. Marv set up a well and septic as a means to get to business, but this did not satisfy the requirements from the city. Hemeyer petitioned to the board of the sewer district to work with him to get the sewer line out to his property. Unbeknownst to Marvin at the time, this was something they were doing regularly for other businesses around town as it was an investment in the town's infrastructure. But the head of the board was a man named Ron Thompson, a close friend of the Docheff family and he told Marvin there was nothing he could do to help. The Thompson family was also a prominent name in the town of Granby. Ron's brother Dick Thompson was the mayor of Granby, and Ron's two sons, Larry and Gary, owned a large construction business in town called Thompson and Sons. Now it would seem Marvin had two choices. Pay the sewer board the $80,000 fee to hook up the sewer and begin construction on his own dime, or go without and remain in violation of the city's ordinances. He decided that for now, he could do without and deal with the issue later. In November of 1992, he petitioned to the sewer line district and requested that Gus Harris grant him the easement needed to connect the sewer line. Harris refused, but did offer to sell him the two acres needed to complete the project for $40,000. The two men agreed and Marvin had the paperwork drawn up, but after months of trying to set up a meeting to get them signed, and getting no response from Harris, Hemeyer gave up, knowing he was getting the runaround. By 1993, Marv was starting to understand the small town forces that be were working against him. So instead of trying to work with them fruitlessly to get things done, he started to focus on his own muffler business, as it was something he knew he could control. Staying away from the controversy would help, at least for a while. He was only working three days a week in the winter and five days in the summer. And still, his business took off, making him more money than he ever thought it would. He was using his time off to enjoy life. He started making friends that he would spend the winters with, snowmobiling the slopes. The longtime bachelor had even met a local woman named Trisha McDonald, who he started dating pretty seriously and taking trips with. A man named Patrick Brower from the local Sky High newspaper even agreed to do a little write-up on his business. Unfortunately, the two never connected to do the story. This may have boiled down to Marv's limited hours and frequent trips out of town, but he felt like he was being jerked around by the guy, just another local, out to get Marvin Hemeyer. You know, a big liberal army brat has had everything in his life given to him. You know. He's, and he, but he knows how to abuse the power of the pen. And that's a big thing up here, is the abuse of power. This newspaper guy, Patrick Brower, had told me after I started the muffler shops on a couple of different occasions, because I called him, and uh, I was advertising with him and so forth. He said that he was going to come down and we'd do an article on my little business. Well, he never did do it. You know, he was doing everything he could to keep me from getting any additional... Uh, publicity. It's one of those, it's, it's a kind of a community that in order for you to get ahead, you have to keep the neighbor down. You've got to keep, you've you got to be bad mouthing everybody. It's not, you know, build yourself up on your own merits. It's tear the other guy down 
However, you can do it legally, of course. In 1994, Marv added onto his property, building a boat storage building with three storage units. He was planning to use his investments to help pay for his retirement. He was going to rent out the storage and the shop or subdivide the property and sell them both. He hadn't forgot about his dispute with Cody Docheff, but it wasn't the first thing on his mind. In 1997, he had the opportunity to repurchase his boulder location and started to rent that out as a passive income. But his Granby County demons would return in that same year when Cody Docheff was slated to become his neighbor. Gus Harris, who had agreed to sell the property next door to Heemeyer years previously before reneging on the deal, was now selling that exact property to Docheff without speaking to Haymeyer. Marv reached out to Gus Harris with no success in an attempt to try and buy it out from Cody Docheff when he heard the rumors, but again, Harris avoided his attempts to speak. Marv was hoping that the property beef had been put to rest now that he was going to be sharing a property line with Docheff, but their interactions were not promising. Still, Cody Docheff bitched at him for taking his property whenever he had the chance. Hoping to avoid further confrontation and wash his hands of Granby, Marvin offered to get his property appraised and sell it to Docheff, as he wasn't exactly thrilled about being downwind of a concrete plant. The appraisal came back at $275,000 and he offered it to Cody Docheff for two hundred and fifty dollars in low monthly payments. Docheff said he would think about it, but of course Marvin never heard another word about it until a year or so later. Knowing that his property had appreciated in value since the last appraisal, he had it reappraised and it came back at $395,000, which again was offered to Docheff who refused it without giving a counteroffer. Now boxed in by Docheff and unable to get the sewer access that he needed, Hemeyer still had one thing going for him. The land that Docheff had purchased was not zoned for industrial, which should stop the noisy, dusty concrete plant from going into operation. But Docheff and his towny friends had other plans. In 1998, Marv woke up to hear construction work going on next door. It was Cody Docheff putting in a foundation for his concrete plant. And little did Marvin Hemeyer know, Docheff had applied for a spot zone of the two-acre property a technique to skirt around typical zoning laws that was technically illegal in Colorado. Had anyone contested the spot zoning within 30 days of it being accepted by Granby, it would have been stopped on the spot. But no one had informed Marvin or anybody else for that matter, and the window to protest came and went. And in effect, this would allow Cody Docheff's neighboring property a much easier path to piggybacking off that industrial status. When Hemeyer found out what was happening, he was furious. He immediately lawyered up and started a public campaign against the plant. Just northwest of Marv's land was a large neighborhood that would also be downwind of the concrete plant. The pollution, dust, and constant noise would negatively affect every one of those residents. And because of this, Marv managed to gather public support for his cause. In July of 1999, Marv and Hemeyer and a host of locals attended the first local meeting to let the town know where they stood. Because of the conflict of interest, Mayor of Granby Dick Thompson recused himself from the hearings, handing the control over to Acting Mayor Dick Broadby, a member of the town zoning board. These meetings continued throughout the year of 1999 with both sides pleading their arguments passionately. But ultimately, in 2000, after four or five meetings, the small town mafia pushed their decision through, approving the building of the concrete plant with a set of conditions that they hoped would please the residents as well. But the decision did little to please Docheff or Hemeyer, who were both upset with how things had gone. And Marv pledged to continue to fight the matter. He also added a man named Casey Farrell to his shit list. Farrell owned the local hardware store called Grambles and was on the town board that ended up approving the concrete plant. All the, the Snickers, uh, you know, the, the, the town council, I'd pass them in the post office and they'd snicker at me after they knew I lost. Uh, on the street, Casey Farrell. I, I, I mean, the guy, what a, what a barbarian. You know, he's just a very sick man. Uh, he comes across as being one of those good, good guys, and he's, he's nothing like that at all. He's, he's just, 
He's part of the problem. As as we're with that whole system down there, you know, the good old boy system. The town had had enough of Marv's meddling in their business. They used his lack of sewer to hit him where it hurts, his business and his money. In November of 2002, the Granby Municipal Court issued a deferred judgment against Marv Hemeyer for failing to connect the sewer line that forbid him from operating his business without sewer. Next, they began fining him $100 a day until he did. Marv tried to protest this decision, explaining how there was no way to comply with the order, but the judgment remained. The town was going to bleed him dry until he left. On top of that, the town also issued more fines for having unsightly vehicles on its property. Furious, Marv wrote a check for $3,351. And in the memo line, he wrote, Cowards and Liars Department. The city returned the gesture and Marv's check, explaining that he had written the amount wrong and making him change the wording from 3351 to 3351. Marvin Hemeyer was now going to war with the town of Granby. The corruption up here is worse than I thought. And it is. It is. It, it, I have no concept of how corrupt these people can be. Well, these people have figured out a pretty good way, being a small community, how to get away with doing things wrong and doing it legally. Meddling in your neighbor's business is destructive for the most part. It's going to come back to haunt you. Marv started by getting a lawyer to review the town zoning procedure for the plant and the lawyer noticed some shortcuts had indeed been taken. Instead of overturning the decision, however, the town decided to restart the process and do it correctly, all while the concrete plant continued to be built. Cody Docheff and the town of Granby knew the conclusion was foregone, no matter what Marvin Hemeyer did. As a last-ditch effort, Marv sued the city of Granby and Cody Docheff in district court. During the litigation process, Cody Docheff called Marv one night and agreed to give him the easement that he needed to hook up the sewer if Marv would just drop the lawsuit. But in Marv's mind, it was far too late for negotiations, and he hung up the phone. However, on April 26, 2003, nine months after filing, the court threw the lawsuit out. Marv's lawyer refused to appeal the ruling, something Marv couldn't understand. His attorney had assured him that he had a winning case to begin with, and now he felt like he had been duped by his own counsel, too. I said, Dietz, if this is good enough to take to court the first time, and, and in face of all the negative feelings that I have about winning it, I said, it's good enough if we lose to appeal it to a higher court. Dietz wouldn't do it. He would not appeal it. Dietz said that he would not appeal it, and he said this in a letter because he had future cases coming up in front of Judge Doucette. And he felt that if he appealed Judge Doucette's ruling, that it would affect adversely on him in these other cases. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know what that is called, but it, without a doubt, it's, uh, it was wrong, you know. Marv later found out that the judge who ruled on his case had a severe conflict of interest. You see, Cody Docheff had moved his concrete operation to a gravel pit outside of town after he originally was foreclosed on in the early 90s. Turned out that the judge owned property next to the gravel pit and he and his wife had pushed back on it being there because they knew it would devalue his property. The judge owned property across the highway to the north. And the judge and his wife went to the, the meetings for the county to oppose this uh, concrete plant being there because it was going to devalue their property. By ruling how he did, he ensured that the concrete plant would be far from his own property. To make matters worse, the Sky High newspaper wrote up a headline about his loss in court. Marv saw this as a way of rubbing his nose in it and publicly shaming him for trying to stand up for himself. 
Mar was feeling at his wit's end. No one was on his side and it seemed there was nothing he could do. He had been screwed over many times before he'd ever gotten to Granby. But this time, it felt personal. It felt coordinated. One evening while he sat in his hot tub and stewed over how he'd been screwed repeatedly by the town of Granby and the families that ran it, how he'd been lied to, backstabbed, and pushed around for the past 10 years, an idea began to formulate that brought him a sense of peace. But it would take a lot of work. A peace came over me that has only come over me a few times before in my life, where I knew that what I was doing was tough, but it was the right thing, and that it was above me. It wasn't me. I was doing this because God wanted me to do it, and I didn't understand it. I said, why did you ask me to do this? Is that why I've never been married, so I didn't have a family? Is that why I've always been successful, so that I would realize my reward before doing this task? According to Mars' calculations, the town had screwed him out of anywhere between 300000 and half a million dollars in revenue over the years, starting all the way back in 92 when Ron Thompson had refused to let him on the sewer line. One day while he was out driving, Marv saw Larry and Gary Thompson, the sons of the now-deceased Ron. Marvin decided he would confront them. And I says, well, I says, you know, about in 1992, your family made some decisions that financially affected my life for the rest of my life and I can't afford it and it cost me at least a minimum of three hundred thousand dollars and I says you need to pay me and he says what are you talking about I basically told him I said don't play ignorant with me and he shut right up he says you know what I'm talking about I says you made that your family made those decisions and I'm referring to the ones of, that where they kept me off, where Ron Thompson kept me off the sanitation uh, district. Uh, I said, you know about that? And I says, you owe me. And I says, I want $300,000 from you. And he says, it'll never happen. And I says, well, I says, I guarantee you, Larry, I'm going to collect. I says, it's a duty I have. I says, I basically can't call myself a man if I don't make this right. And I says, Ron died. And I think of all the money that he got, uh, that you, you inherited, because he died from your father's estate, that you had all inherited, I think that you ought to probably pay me with that. And he says, he says not going to happen. And I says, well, I am going to collect. And I drove away. I got about four or five truck lengths away. And he basically confirmed in my mind right there that he knew what I was talking about. And he knew what had been done. Because he had one thing to say. He screamed it at me as I'm about five truck lengths away. He screamed, you can suck my dick. Back in July of 2002, Marv had gone out to an auction in California and got a great deal on a Komatsu D355A bulldozer. He had it parked in the access road with a for sale sign until 2003. Unable to do business, Marvin shut down his muffler shop and put everything up for auction, including the dozer. And everything sold except for the land and the dozer, something Marvin saw as a sort of sign. It is unique how the Jeskies made the minimum, the Cabelco made the minimum, the Nova went over the minimum, and they sold. But what two things did I keep? The Cabelco, I mean the Komatsu dozer, and the property. So, so stop and think about this. I wasn't supposed to walk away from this because the Komatsu was still there. The build property was still there. Around this time, Marv and his girlfriend got into an argument and the two split. It was the only relationship he had in Granby. And if he didn't feel alone there before, he surely did now. Shortly after, Marv figured out a way to deal with his property. The local trash company negotiated to lease his land to station their vehicles. And as the trash company was growing quickly, it wasn't long until they offered to purchase the property from Hemeyer. He sold it for $400,000, 
almost ten times what he originally purchased it for. But it wasn't all good times, because within days the trash company had gotten permission to tie into Dochep's water and sewer line. Marvin back rented the storage building on the property and moved his dozer in there. It fit only by an inch vertically and two inches on the sides when the blade was removed. Another sign that Marvin was on the right track. And I had two, three inches of clearance. I drove it right in there. It fit through that door so tight you almost had to grease it to get it in there. Why did that particular dozer fit in the building? So, so I'm thinking, well, this is good. I get it inside. Now I can build it. Must be what I'm supposed to do. Marv had no relationship, no business, and a lot of time to devote to his plan of revenge, and it was time to get to work. He was going to turn that bulldozer of his into a violent vehicle of vengeance, a tinkerer's tank, a working man's war machine. He began by armoring his Komatsu. For each section, he used two half-inch thick pieces of steel with a layer of concrete that he would pour between them. This armor would surround the engine, cabin, and much of the tracks. In order to start moving and attaching his armor plates to the shell he was making, he built a large lift that he could use to hold them up as he welded the pieces in place. The lift allowed him to work on the armor while getting it out of the way when he needed to work in the cab. He no longer had a personal or professional life to get in the way, and he could devote his time and energy completely to his project. He worked long hours, usually at night, when the noise he made could go unnoticed, and he slept during the days on a cot that he had set up in the shop. He would go days without returning home or cleaning himself up. He set up a surveillance system with cameras outside the shop that led to monitors within so he could see if anybody might be getting too suspicious. Since his tank would be covered in steel and have no visibility, he thought it would be a good idea to use a similar system to control it. He connected five cameras on the outside to three monitors in the cab, and the cameras would be protected by a three-inch layer of bulletproof plastic, and he rigged up a system of pressurized air that could blow away any dust or debris that might get in the way. He also knew that the inside of the dozer would get hot when he was doing his work so he made an air conditioning system that would keep him cool as he took his revenge. He fashioned three gun ports that he could use if he got himself in a jam, one in the front, one to the right, and one to the rear. The project was an enormous undertaking, especially for one man in his 50s. To put it into perspective, by the time he was finished, he had added 12 tons to the machine, totaling out at 61 tons of fuck Granby. When he was about halfway finished, the trash company had an inspection done on the property for insurance purposes that almost got Marv caught. This involved a walkthrough of every building, including the one that Marv was building his dozer. He covered it with a large tarp, and when the insurance company asked Marv what they were looking at, he made up a story about working on a cooling system with the professor, and it somehow flew. It was yet another thing that Marv saw as a sign he was doing what was right. During the winter of 2003, Marv took a break and enjoyed life to the fullest. He loved Colorado winters and he knew this would be his last. He spent the time snowmobiling with his friends, letting him rest and relax before completing his mission. As the winter came to an end and he was getting back to work, He Meyer's father would pass away on March 31st, 2004. And this wrecked Marv. He had never been that close with his mother or siblings, but he and his father had an unmistakable bond. It had always been his dad who supported what his son was doing in his life, and now he was gone. Marv returned home to South Dakota to see his family and his home for the first time in years and for the last time ever. After the funeral service, he visited his father's ranch in his hometown of Castlewood. Here at the home he grew up in without the man who raised him, he was truly broken. He took out a camera and snapped a selfie that shows the enormous amount of grief and loneliness he was feeling at the time. If there was any part of him that was having second thoughts about his plan for revenge, it died with his father. Moreover, his father's death would actually help Marv financially when the whole thing was done. 
You see, Marv had given away the entire $400,000 from the sale of his property to his father, which was now distributed via his will to Marvin's two brothers and sister. By giving away the money and it being separated by the will, he had effectively guaranteed that when his rampage was complete, his victims would have no way of collecting damages from his estate. He had completely separated himself from his money and his possessions. He had no romantic life, no kids, no family he was close to. He was now a man with nothing to lose, making him a truly dangerous man. He returned to Granby in May of 2004 and spent that last month or so completing the construction of his dozer. After that, he finished up his audio manifesto that he had been recording sporadically since the start of the year. He already had his list of targets ready, so there was nothing stopping him now. You put yourself in my shoes and tell me how you would feel at 50 years old realizing that you've wasted 10 years of your life because of someone's malice. Those who made me your enemy, they are the guilty ones. The Thompsons are guilty. The Dochefs are guilty. The Granby Town Board is guilty. The Granby Planning Commission is guilty. My neighbors are guilty. It took all of you 10 years to get me. And you got me, no doubt about it. I got screwed big time. So now, I believe that I have to leave this world with a debt so great to you it can never be repaid. But it has to be done. And the world will write stories about how wrong I am. That's the way it's supposed to be. And that's the way it will be. God's will be done. Through me. In the early morning hours of June 4th, 2004, Marv woke up in his makeshift sleeping quarters in the warehouse. After a year and a half of planning, he was finally ready to go through with his plan of vengeance. He shaved his head and put on a pair of work jeans and a button-up Hawaiian shirt before making his final round of preparations. He fueled up his dozer, made sure his compressed air tanks were full, and, not knowing exactly how the day would go, loaded it with plenty of food, water, ammo, homemade explosives, and a gas mask. Next, he prepared the three gun ports that he had fashioned. The one in the front was armed with the semi-automatic 5.52 FNFNC assault rifle. The port to the right was outfitted with a 223 caliber Mini-14, and the back port would get the most firepower as it was loaded up with a 50 caliber semi-automatic Barrett M82 sniper rifle. He also had other guns along with him in the cabin including a 22 caliber long rifle, a kel P11 handgun, and a 357 Magnum Smith & Wesson Model 686 revolver. After checking to make sure all of his cameras were working, he used his lift to lower the armored shell down on the bulldozer, sealing himself inside. There was no turning back now. At 2 p.m., Marv e. Meyer fired up his tank and tore through the eastern wall of his warehouse, heading directly for Cody Dochev's concrete plant. He first went after a small precast plant west of the main building. It went down like a house of cards and e. Meyer's treads rolled over what was left. Cody Dochev and Larry Thompson were on the site working when they heard the destruction begin. Cody ran over to where the sounds were coming from, in no way ready for what he would see. The armored bulldozer was now making a beeline for the plant's main building. Cody knew instantly that it was Marvin inside and ran to get a gun from one of his employees. With the 357 Magnum in hand, Dochef drew and aimed at the dozer, firing three times, each round skipping off the armor without making as much as a dent. 
Cody moved on to plan B instantly, grabbing the largest piece of angle iron that he and the people around him could find and attempting to jam it into the tracks, trying to immobilize the beast. But the tread snapped the rod like a twig in the treads and kept right on rolling. Next he tried climbing on the dozer shell to get a better shot down on top of Hemeyer. Even though the machine had been armored well from above, Marvin didn't want people climbing on the machine so he greased up the shell before he started the rampage. Cody figured this out pretty quickly when he slid off and came crashing to the ground. He and his employees couldn't do anything but look on as Hemeyer tore through the side of the building and went for the support structures. He meticulously accelerated and reversed until the entire side of the structure was reduced to rubble and the building collapsed. At around 2.15, the first 911 calls began coming in, the first from the trash company that he departed from. 911, what's your emergency? Uh, this is Jerry at the trash company. Uh huh. And there is a bulldozer over at Mount Park Concrete destroying the building. It's destroying the building? Yeah, is anyone on it? Yeah, it's all in tape and metal, and you can't see who's driving or anything. Yeah, they can't get a good stop. 911, what is your emergency? Hi, this is Jerry at the trash company again. Yeah, it is headed for their main building right now. Headed for the main building. Okay. Granby police put out a wide tactical alert, drawing in officers from all around. But again, this was just going to bring more piss to a ship fight. They had no idea what they would be rolling up to. At 219, Sheriff's Deputy Jim Cracker was the first to arrive. Later, he would describe what he saw as less of a dozer and more like a tank, and that the noise from the engine and squeaking of the tracks was deafening. He pulled out his police-issued shotgun and ordered the vehicle to stop. Larry Thompson suggested to Cody that if he went and got the biggest loader that they had, maybe he could get under the tracks and flip the dozer. Dochev manned his loader and sped towards the dozer, which was still destroying his building. When he tried to lift the dozer with his bucket, he found that it actually lifted up the back end of his loader four feet off the ground instead. It was pointless. He still thought perhaps he could use this big loader to ram Hemeyer, so he backed up and sped towards it. The violent collision did nothing with the dozer and Cody went crashing into the windshield of his vehicle. Still, it was enough to annoy Marv and get a reaction. Marv briefly stopped his destruction to unload several 50 caliber rounds into the bucket of the loader, causing Dochev to abandon his attempts to intervene. After firing several shotgun blasts with no effect, Deputy Cracker returned to his car to get his M4 rifle. Around this time, Cracker was joined by Colorado State Troopers Dave Batura and Jack DeSanti, as well as Sheriff's Deputy John Lynch. Batura and DeSanti took cover behind a large concrete barrier while Cracker spoke with Dochev, who insisted that it was Hemeyer who was controlling the machine, but he also told him he thought the vehicle was unmanned and being radio operated by Marvin who was somewhere in the nearby hills. Sheriff's Deputy Sergeant Rich Garner arrived on the scene on the west side of the batch plant, armed with an M4 patrol rifle, and raced around the front where he joined Batura and DeSanti behind the concrete barrier. The three began firing at the side of the dozer from behind their cover, prompting Hemeyer to fire some rounds back in their direction from his Mini-14, nearly hitting Garner's head and striking the concrete barrier several times. Once the fire from the officers stopped, and they were taking full shelter. Marvin repositioned his vehicle to face them, fired a few more shots from his 552 rifle on the front gun port, pinning the officers down, and then accelerated at his top speed of seven miles per hour towards the barrier, destroying it with the blade as the officers fled. Marvin decided it was time to move on to his next target, heading eastbound to the south side of the building towards the city. But on his way, he pushed an unmarked cop car out of the way until it flipped and he ran it over. As he continued east, a group of police armed with revolvers, M14 battle rifles, and M4 assault rifles attempted to block his path with a hail of gunfire, all which bounced pathetically off the armor, leaving the machine unharmed. Mar fired a handful of shots back in their direction, causing the officers to scatter and clearing a path onto the main highway. At this point, it was known that it was Marvin, and he wasn't stopping at the concrete plant. Under Sheriff Glenn Trainer took off running behind the bulldozer. Like Cody Dochev, Trainer wanted to get on top of the bulldozer and see if he could enter the vehicle through the roof. 
He, unlike old man Dochev, managed to get on top of the dozer, but when he got there he was shocked to find no hatch or access point to the inside of the vehicle. He did see an air vent for the AC system that he hoped would be a weak point. He fired six rounds into it with no success, and then six towards the engine block, also nothing. He kept firing at what he thought would be possible weak points, shooting 37 shots in total, but not one of them managed to slow Marvin Hemeyer down. As the behemoth barreled down the highway towards its next target, under Sheriff Trainer changed tactics. Another officer tossed him up a flashbang that was dropped down the exhaust vent of the AC unit. There was a loud bang and a large puff of smoke, but still the treads continued down the highway towards Mountain Parks Electric, Cody Dochev's other business. As it turned off the highway, the police were finishing evacuating the building just in time. With Under Sheriff Trainer still on top of the roof, the dozer slammed into the side of Mountain Parks Electric tearing through the brick structure like tissue paper. He spent several minutes driving in and out of the front of the building until it began to collapse. Once he finished there, he backed out of the debris and turned southeast, now heading toward Granby Town Hall. Police efforts to stop Hemeyer and warn the small town population had been steadily elevating during the entire rampage. With him heading down the highway towards Town Hall, a reverse 911 call went out to everyone in the town warning them of the situation. There was also a large group of SWAT officers now traveling alongside Hemeyer, firing armor-piercing rounds. But like a virgin on prom night, these attempts just left residue and did not manage to penetrate. When Hemeyer attempted to return fire from his Mini-14 at the SWAT officers from his right gun port, he realized that something was wrong. Unbeknownst to him when he pulled the trigger, he had bent the barrel of that gun while busting through the Mountain Park's electric building, and when he fired, the bullet destroyed the bent barrel, leaving the gun disabled. He was now limited to shooting forwards and backwards. On his way to Town Hall, he plowed a large flatbed truck into the front of Maple Park's builders with ease. As the Town Hall building was being frantically evacuated, Officer Trainer still on top of the vehicle, realized he was in a bad spot and would surely be crushed when the dozer started destroying Town Hall. He jumped off, firing 12 more shots toward the vehicle as he fled. Hemeyer ripped through the front entrance of Town Hall and drove along the sidewall. He then pulled into the back lot of the building and rammed through the playground out back, mangling it into a heap of unrecognizable twisted steel. He finished Town Hall off by ramming in and out at the back of the building, targeting the north, east, and west walls before leaving the building destroyed. With his third target now in ruins, Marvin pulled back out onto Main Street towards Sky High News, now being escorted by a rolling roadblock of police agencies in front and back, desperately trying to stop the rampage. After turning off Main Street and passing first in a gate, he made a detour toward the Liberty Savings Bank branch, rolling over a fire hydrant and the town's only stoplight in the process. The tank rolled through the entrance of the bank on the west side of the building, caving in the walls. While doing so, the state troopers attempted to coordinate a flanking of the rear of the vehicle. Armed with armor-piercing shells and their shotguns, they unleashed everything they had at the tank's rear viewports and hydraulic system under the ripper. Again, the attempts proved fruitless and the shells just ricocheted and shattered into the air, posing a risk to everybody in the area except Marv Hemeyer. Taking notice of this, Marv grabbed his 50 cal, aiming out of the rear gun port and ripped several shots out, causing the troopers to quickly scatter, giving Marv the room to back out of the bank and continue towards Sky High News on a gate avenue. Now sure it was Marv at the helm of the beast, the police had been making lists of where he may be going on his rampage and were prepared to warn Patrick Brower, editor of Sky High News. Officers raced ahead of the dozer and into the news building, telling everybody inside to clear out the back door. Sergeant Leo Pahatsky of the Greene County Sheriff's Office was off duty that day, but had heard the sirens and the shots fired and decided to show up on the scene to see how he could help. He happened to have a video camera on him that day, and after seeing how ineffective his fellow officers were in stopping the machine, he decided the best use of his time was to start rolling. Uh, 
As the office finished evacuating, the dozer took an immediate right-hand turn, rolled over the curb, and slammed into the side of the building. The front wall immediately crumbled, and less than a second later, the entire front facade of the building came crashing down on top of the bulldozer, enveloping the area in a thick cloud of dust. Marv maneuvered his dozer blade along the side wall of the building and methodically started edging away the structure, causing it to collapse entirely moments later. Patrick Brower, being a newsman after all, saw an opportunity to snap a photo or two, but Marvin started firing his 552 from the gun port, which made him forget about his creative side and take off running. From here, Hemeyer pulled a 180 degree turn and returned to the main highway. On his way, he took some time to have a little fun, bulldozing a handful of cars out of his way. Two SWAT officers taking cover behind a patrol car started firing their M4 rifles at the front of the dozer as Marv played. Again, he returned fire from his front gun port, forcing the officers to bail on their assault. Now desperately in need of more firepower, the police were doing everything they could to scrape together something that could penetrate the vehicle as the vehicle was on its slow creep towards its next target. Police were sourcing more armor-piercing rounds, and the chief of police in the nearby town of Kremling offered to let them use his 50 caliber rifle. Checking Marv's trajectory against the list of possible victims, the police assumed that he was now heading towards the Thompson family home, where Ron's 82-year-old widow, Thelma, was taking a nap. Would you call 887-3710? That's the Thompson residence. We think the vehicle is the uh, bulldozer is headed there. We need to have everybody evacuated out of the Thompson's residence. I copy at 1548. Gary Thompson, her son, called her and gave her a heads up that a giant bulldozer was on the way to destroy the home. She was reluctant to believe her son, thinking it to be a bad joke. Police managed to evacuate Thelma just before the bulldozer arrived and turned her single-story home into a single layer of debris. From there, the machine turned towards the Thompson construction outfit across the street. It was during the short trip that Deputy Rich Garner who was chasing the dozer on foot, was given the 50 caliber rifle that the police managed to source. Garner licked off five shots at the tank's armor, leaving a noticeably larger mark than anything before, but still unable to pierce the armor. The dozer made quick work of one of the construction warehouses, causing it to collapse. Hemeyer then turned and drove towards the entrance of the main office and parking garage, completely tearing away the front facade and crushing most of the equipment inside. As he pulled away from the construction business, he tipped over a semi on the property. Then he snagged an XL Energy pickup and jammed it into the front of one of the Thompson's nearby rental buildings, folding the truck in half. Crowds of locals were now beginning to form to watch the destruction, and the helicopters, news and law enforcement, were now buzzing overhead. It was shortly before 4 p.m. and Marvin's rampage was nearing two hours, and he was now heading towards the most dangerous target on the list. Turning south, he drove down the hill towards the southern edge of Granby, where independent gas was located. Sitting on the property were hundreds of large industrial-grade tanks of propane. If Marv managed to ignite one of those tanks, it could set off a chain reaction that could kill everybody living in the nearby neighborhood. Massive evacuation efforts to clear everyone in the area happened as frantically as possible. At 417, he reached the plant and the police who had been flanking him retreated to avoid the carnage that could follow. Marv turned his dozer around to face his 50 cal towards the tanks, loaded the gun with explosive incendiary rounds and began firing. Fortunately for everybody around, his field of fire was greatly limited and the shot struck his own armor because the dozer's ripper was in the way. 
He attempted to lower it, but had no luck. Then he attempted to reposition to have a better angle, but more rounds exploded against his own armor. Only one round got through, striking a transformer next to one of the tanks. He abandoned the propane tanks and headed back towards town. The police were now more desperate than ever, calling in help from the Air National Guard and Army National Guard. In the meantime, however, they had commandeered two county-owned earth movers, or scrapers, hoping the massive machinery would be enough to box in the out-of-control dozer. Yeah, we got a scraper at the county shops, and I got one down here if you want to try to box him in. Well, I asked for him to get him up here two minutes ago. Let's go. Okay. Okay. Um, the vehicle is now headed down towards uh, independent gas. They said it's on the west side of the building, coming out of the ground. As Marv made his way up the hill back towards the highway, one of the gigantic earth movers positioned itself at the intersection, hoping to barricade the bulldozer and keep it from gaining access to the main road once again. Hemeyer was not discouraged by the presence and continued forward, ramming into it and pushing it out of the way with ease, showing just how much brute strength he was working with. And within moments, he was en route to his next target. Casey Farrell's Grambles Hardware Store on Main Street. Things had been running smooth for Marvin for over two hours, but the first sign of trouble was here. As Marvin overtook the curb in front of Grambles, a large cloud of white smoke began to pour out of the engine bay. He'd utilized antifreeze as a coolant system for the radiator, but it was now overheating and burning off. And the fumes may have disoriented Marv because as he approached the hardware store, he veered right and clipped the local printing shop, knocking out walls in the process. He maneuvered back onto the road and repositioned himself facing the hardware store. Then, Marv accelerated into the front facade, turning the wall into a cloud of dust and debris. Then he backed out and repositioned once again to align himself with the left wall of the building. He heaved his vehicle forward once again, using the blade to rip through the wall like cardboard and collapsing the structure as he went. The second commandeered earth mover pulled behind Marvin in an attempt to block him in the alley as he was pushing down. It probably would have been as ineffective as the first in barricading Marv if the situation had a chance to play out. But unfortunately for Marv, an unforeseen problem would end his rampage in its tracks. Grambles, unbeknownst to Marv, had a basement in the back of the building. When Marv's tracks rolled over the roof of the basement, the sheer weight of the dozer caused the basement roof to cave in, sinking Marv's right tread in and trapping him in place. He attempted to reverse and get out of the hole, but only having a single tread, he was unable to get any usable traction. With his dozer trapped and overheating, Hemeyer knew his day of vengeance was coming to a swift end. He killed the engine as police began cautiously surrounding the dozer. There was no way of knowing if Marv would emerge shooting or if the machine was rigged to detonate. Faced with what he surely knew was the end of his life, he decided to light up one last cigarette there in the darkened cabin before he went out on his own terms. After finishing his last sweet cigarette ever, he picked up his 357 Model 686 revolver pushed the barrel up to the roof of his mouth, and pulled the trigger. Marv's two-hour and seven-minute rampage, as well as his life, was over with a muffled pop heard outside the dozer. It would take law enforcement nearly 12 hours to get through the bulldozer's armor. They attempted and failed three times to breach it with explosives before deciding to slowly cut through it using acetylene torches. They finally managed to breach the inner cabin of the dozer around 2 a.m. on June 5, 2004, revealing the body of Marvin Hemeyer, entombed in his own creation and surrounded by weapons. Despite the police having fired over 200 rounds at the dozer and Marv firing 55 back, not a single person was shot that day, nor was anybody injured. Miraculously, Marvin Hemeyer was the only casualty from the destructive rampage. During his day of vengeance, he managed to damage or destroy 13 buildings in the town of Granby, racking up over $7 million in damages. 
It would take eight years to repair the destruction done by a single man in a couple hours, finishing in 2012, and the effects would echo through the community even to this day. In accordance with his final wishes, Marv P. Meyer's body was cremated. Later that winter, the handful of friends that he had made there in Granby, the ones he'd spent snowmobiling with in the winters, took them and spread his ashes atop his favorite trail on Gravel Mountain as they revved their engines one final time as a tribute to Marv. Hemeyer's dozer was towed to a police impound warehouse after his rampage, where it sat for almost an entire year. Many in the town wanted to use it as a tourist attraction, a way to make lemonade out of the lemons that Marv left behind. But ultimately, the town of Granby made the decision to cut the machine up into scrap and spread the pieces out all over the country into different scrap yards, making it impossible for fans of E. Meyer's actions to get their hands on a keepsake of the day. Many are sympathetic to the plight of E. Meyer, seeing him as a model American patriot standing up to a corrupt government, and he's been commemorated as something of a folk hero. There's no doubt that he was wronged by the town of Granby, or that they treated him like an outsider who didn't belong. For 12 years, he did his best to put up with what the city threw at him, but in the end, he was just pushed too far. Maybe if they would have worked with him, or opened their arms to him as a community. Maybe if he would have gotten a fair day in court. None of this would have had to happen, but in Marv's eyes, it did. So what do you think of Hemeyer's actions that day? Was he a man who was pushed to his breaking point by a corrupt local government, or just an incredibly inventive domestic terrorist? Let me know in the comments. Don't forget to leave a like as it helps me a ton here on YouTube and subscribe if you appreciate the content. I also want to thank the 10,000 or so new subscribers to the channel. It's your support that keeps things going here. And of course, I've got to shout out my Patreon members, Paul B., Brandon Baker, Brandon Boyson, and Caleb Coleman. Thank you guys. And with that, Manic out.